two, the quintessential snail. By its knob sip, sailing upside down, by its inner sexes, by the crystalline pimplings of its skirts, by the sucking on lifelong kiss of its toppling motion, by the viscose optics now extruded, now wizened instantaneously by the riches grating up a food, food path, by the pop shell in its nick of dry, by excretion, the earthworm coils, the glibling, glib, glibin, by the gilt slipway, and by pointing perhaps as far back in time as ahead, a sure being folded interior, by boiling on salt, by coming uncut over a razor's edge, by hiding the oligocene under leaf, may this and every snail sense itself ornament the weave of presence. Molax, Lou Marie. Lou Marie shows us how effective poetry can be in conveying the essence of an animal in just one sentence. The snail's ability to make us look to the past, pointing perhaps as far back in time as ahead, for example, is a quality few creatures possess. Not only does the snail leave a visible trace of its presence in the form of a shining trail, Murray's gilt slipway. It also provides us with tangible continuity with the past through the persistence long after the animal inside has died of its shell. Antiquity is implied in the phrase hiding the oligocene under leaf and brings to mind the opening lines of Ted Hughes' poem, Snails. Out of the earliest ooze, old even by stone time, slimed as eels, wrinkled as whales, and cold as dogs' noses. The snail, like the tortoise, is a living fossil. It provides us with a reminder of how a particular body plan has endured over millions of years and is an example of a creature that has undergone diversity while keeping its body plan essentially unchanged. The characteristic spiral imprint of a sea snail is a common feature of fossil containing rocks, while the shelly remains of primitive man's molluscan meals continue to provide us with an important source of paleo environmental information for those interested in unraveling a more recent past. Stonehenge, for example, was given a Bronze Age dating as a result of studying the assemblage of snail shells in its vicinity. While much of the prehistory of the chalk has been understood by analyzing the remains of snail shells, which provide evidence of previous human activity and land use. But paleo, the paleo, paleo, paleontologist Douglas Arwin accords snails' favorite status amongst fossils. His interest in them relates primarily to snails of the Permian period. Their presence in rocks demonstrates how capable snails have been of making a living in different ways, how they achieved a wide geographic distribution and how they have survived 
hostile times that saw other major groups like the brachiopods and the ammonoids wiped off the planet. Snails, because of their ubiquity, ubiquity, ubiquity and their persistence, proved particularly useful to Arwin in studying how animal numbers fluctuated over long periods of time. Snails, like other animals, have been subject to mass extinctions as well as periods of prolification, but in contrast to many other groups, they have survived and even flourished, as Arwen points out. The essence of solving the problems, problem of differential extinction is being able to compare similar winners and losers. A clade or group of animals whose members share features of a common ancestor where all species survive is not particularly edifying, nor is a group that almost completely disappeared. But with snails, there are enough winners and losers to make useful comparisons. John Phillips, who in the mid-19th century was responsible for dividing the fossil record into different eras, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, was convinced that each represented a separate act of creation. The Paleozoic had its brachiopods, the Mesozoic its bivalve mollusks, but it was the Cenozoic that boasted snails. While each era is indeed characterized by an apparent abundance of some creatures over others, it would be wrong to conclude that snails belonged to just one era. The first recognizable snails put in, put in an appearance during the Cambrian period at the start of the Paleozoic. They underwent prolification, but by the end of the Paleozoic, they also underwent a considerable decline in numbers. The threat of extinction was to prove a watershed in their history. The snails of the Permian period, the majority of which fed on the detritus on the oceans, gave way to carnivorous predatory snails that spread and diversified during the ensuring ens ens Mesozoic era. A further dramatic decline in snail numbers occurred at the end of the Mesozoic, a time when a staggering 95% of all living species died out. But again, snails bounced back in the Cenozoic, emphasizing their survivor status. Today, the snails constitute the largest, most diverse group within the mollusks, with over 80,000 described species. Many remain unnamed and undescribed, as I discovered when I gave the Natu Natural History Museum several I had collected in Borneo. When I tentatively asked when they might be examined, I was told that they hadn't quite finished with those collected on Captain Cook's expeditions. The earliest land snails are to be found during the Paleozoic era associated with insects and early land vertebrates. There is then 
a gap in the fossil record until the start of the Cenozoic era when in the Paleocene land snails again put in an appearance. When they reappeared, they were indistinct, indistinguishable, indistinguishable from present day families of snails. In that interval, land snails had spread across the planet, occupying virtually every environment except the polar caps. If survival and an ability to populate a wide variety of habitats is a characteristic feature of a snail, it is its shell that makes the animal instantly recognizable. Pleasing to the eye and satisfying to hold, fossilized or living, the spiral configuration of the shell picks it out from other animals, most of which have a bi bilateral symmetry. Formed inside the egg, where it is known as the protoconch, the rudimentary shell becomes the apex of the adult shell, with growth occurring as a result of material being added to its lip. The type of growth is unusual but also clever in that it maintains its shape as the animal within grows bigger. The revved Henry Moseley comment commenting on the geometry of the snail shell in the early 1800s remarked that God has bestowed upon this humble architect the snail the practical skills of a learned mathematician. It was later in the same century that Darcy Wentworth Thompson first used mathematical language to describe the snail shell's spiral shape in his classic work on growth and form. The surface of any shell may be imagined to be generated by the revolution about a fixed axis of a closed curb which remaining always geomet geometrical, geometri geometrically similar to itself increases its dimensions continually and since the scale of the figure increases in geometrical progression while the angle of rotation increases in arithmetical and the center of simi similitude remains fixed. The curve traced in space by corresponding points in the, in the generating curve is in all such cases, an equi equiangular spiral. Translating this mathematical language into pictures, the paleontologist David Raup was the first to produce on his computer a range of hypothetical shell shapes based on a helic helically coiled patterns. Of all the, the theoretically possible shapes, only a minority could be recognized among either living or extinct shells. Certain shapes appeared to have been exploited in preference to others. Richard Darwin's in his book Climbing Mount Improbable talks of how he devised a computer program in which shells of different cross-sectional cross shapes were bred by artificial selection, the human eye acting as the selector. His zoo of computer shells show, shows an uncanny resemblance to those found in nature. 
when the variety of shapes is seen, it becomes easy to understand the attraction among collectors for amassing different types of snail shell. Shell ornamentation proves to be even more extravagant than shell shape amongst snails is seen not just among the large Pacific sea snails but among much among the much smaller land snails of Southeast Asia. Java Mulen has executed some marvelous drawings of tiny snails of the genus Opistostoma that conjure up certain lines from Tennyson. See what the lovely shell, small and pure as pearl, lying close to my feet, frail but a work divine, made so fairly well. How delicate spire and horror, horror, how exquisitely minute a miracle of design. William Pally, the 18th century theologian, would doubtless have wondered at the complexity of design of some of these tiny Bolian snail shells. It is easy to imagine him using, using them as examples of God's hand in nature, but equally easy to imagine Richard Dow Darkin's response. Wrong, gloriously and utterly wrong. It is all the product of cumulative selection by slow and gradual degrees. It is tempting to think that the ribs, flanges, and other ornamentation seen in these small snails are a response to environmental demand based on a need for defense against predators or a disguise so that they become more difficult to spot in the places they inhabit. One evolutionary biologist Menno Shiltuizen, who has made a special study of these snails, points out that these explanations may be insufficient to account for the full range of shell diversity in this highly diverse group. He hypothesizes that Shell diversification may be the result of sexual selection acting on shell ornamentation. Mating snails, he believes, are able to sense each other's particular shell ornamentation. The tactile clues provided lead to successful mating with highly ornamented individual being overrepresented amongst the mating pairs. The hypothesis has yet to be tested, but is an interesting example of how a tiny snail may tell us something about the process of selection. Returning to the fundamental spiral, the whorls of an individual snail shell can either be in contact with one another, the usual pattern, or disconnected, as in warm shells, or simply close to one another but not touching, as in the precious wentel trap. When they are fully in contact with one another, the lines of contact form, form the such was of the shell. The largest whorl culminates in the shell aperture bound by a lip in which, which in some cases is extended into a canal known as a siphon. A shell may have a variable number of 
walls be flattened so that all of the walls lie in a single plane as in the ram's horn shell or be in the form of a spire seen to its fullest extent in ogre shell limpets are snails that have lost their spire entirely replacing it with a simple conical shapes and a large aperture in marked contrast to limpets are quarries where the aperture is reduced to a mere slit it used to be thought that a feature like shield coiling once lost in the course of evolution couldn't even return so-called dodo's dolo's law we know now know otherwise as a result of work on a family of snails called Calipriades. Rachel Collin and Roberto Cipriani have shown that in, his, in this family of limpets, coiled shells re-evolved at least on one occasion, perhaps more than once. Perhaps Frodo Baggins was right to pity snails and all animals that carried their homes on their backs. On several occasions in the course of their evolutionary history, snails have abandoned their shells in favor of a slug-like habit. A shell can seriously limit mobility. Loss of the shell meant that the animal could extend its range, find protection in corners where a shell would be an encumbrance and become less dependent on calcium, an element essential for shell growth. The loss of a shell has, in some cases, been partial and in others, complete. The naked slug is thought by evolutionists to represent the pinnacle of snail evolution. Gardeners might grudgingly agree, knowing how hard it is to eliminate them from the vegetable pot. The fleshy part of the snail, rather than being an amorphous, amorphous extensible piece of muscle is in fact a highly organized and complex, ex complex example of animal architecture. It can be conveniently divided into a muscular foot, a visceral mass contained within the shell, and a space known as a mantle cavity into which the gut empties its waste. It is in this same cavity that the head with its tentacles finds shelter and that the breathing organs are normally located. In snails with translucent shells, these in snails with translucent shells, these and other internal features can be made out without resorting to dissection. Sometimes a pulsating heart can be seen, often a kidney, intestine, and with optical assistance, reproductive organs of considerable complexity. The head of a snail is particularly fascinating. It has a prehistoric, almost alien appearance. The face of the round-mouthed snail, Pomatius elegans, isn't too dissimilar to that of a mini mini miniaturized elephant with its gray skin, long trunk-like proboscis, and eyes placed at the base of two tusk-like tentacles. 
Other snails have warty heads with eyes at the tip of their tentacles, but facial appearances can vary considerably. The tentacles themselves, a hallmark of the snail, are highly sensitive structures that can rapidly retract or quiver in response to chemicals in the air. Shakespeare once remarked that only lovers' feeling was more soft and sensible than the tender horns of cuckooed snails, and certainly they are the features most emphasized in cartoons and illustrations of snails. Lazzaro Spallanzani an 18th century Italian scientist viewed the head of a snail from an entirely different perspective. He was interested in repair and regeneration and was responsible for the first snail transplant. Spallanzani removed part of the head of a snail and showed it, showed it could regrow. He went on to transplant the face of one snail onto the body of another. So successful was the experiment that Voltaire, in a letter to a friend, expressed the hope that one day the same might be achieved in humans. He had in mind some of his less attractive acquaintances. Little did Voltaire anticipated that in 2005, a French lady by the name of Isabelle de Noir, whose face had been badly mauled by a dog, would have it partially replaced with the facial tissues of another person. Consideration has so far been given to those external features of a snail that are immediately apparent to the human eye and which could be said to characterize, to characterize the animal. There are, of course, others less immediately apparent but equally distinct, distinctive. One such feature of, offers a field day for dentists while another has exercised zoologists mind more than anything else in snail biology. Housed out of view within the snail's mouth is a ribbon called a radula in which teeth are set in rows. It is a structure seen only in, in mollusks and most snails with the exception of some parasitic ones possesses one. Its licking motion was first noted by a German malacologist Franz Troskel in 1836. The teeth are renewed as they become damaged, much like those of a shark. Differences in dentition represent differences in diet. Those land snails that scrape algae from stones have numerous small teeth, while carnivorous sea snails have fewer, bigger teeth, fewer, larger teeth. The patterns produced by a radula on glass coated with a film of algae can be arresting, as can close-up views of radulas themselves. The idea that a snail has teeth, in some cases hundreds of them, may come as a surprise, but a second feature, body torsion, proves even more surprising and somewhat puzzling. Again, it is peculiar to snails and quite distinct from shell coiling. It is a twist in the snail's body occurring early in the animal's development. Back in the Cumbrian period, 
600 million years ago when creatures resembling modern day snails first appeared, torsion was already present. The shell and the mantle cavity could be seen to have rotated 180 degrees in relation to the rest of the body. Torsion has persisted, but the reason for its existence remains obscure, being present both in the body of a young larval stage of sea snail, snails as well as in the adult. What torsion achieved was to bring the mantle cavity to a position in front of and above the head. Walter Garstang, a professor of zoology at Oxford, had his own theory about how torsion arose, which he published in verse form. Among his many achievements, Garstang was responsible for writing a parody on Gay, the student opera applied poetic analysis to bird song and was also an accomplished marine biologist who wrote several important scientific papers. What he is mainly remembered for is a book of zoological verses entitled Larval Forms. He was one of the first biologists to realize that natural selection acted just as powerful on the early stages of development as on the adult, and he applied this knowledge to sea snails and their larvae. Snails that live in the sea shed, sea shed their eggs and sperm directly into the water. From the fertilized egg hatches a larva, not the mini adult, but a quite distinct creature with a two-lobed swimming organ or vel vel velum fringed with hairs and called a veliga. It is capable of swimming or being carried some distance by the ocean currents and it is in the veliga stage that torsion first occurs. Garstang argued that the twist gave more protection to the lava's vulnerable head than if it hadn't occurred. In a poem entitled The Ballad of the Veliga or How the Gastropod Got Its Twists, Reproduced in full as an ap appendix, Gastang set out his argument. Selection in favor of the twist in the lava was, in his view, so strong that it outweighed contrary selection in adult life, and so this larval feature become a feature of the adult snail too. An example of pyedomorphosis, whether or not Garstang was right, is open to debate. What is clear is that as a result of torsion, the animal couldn't conveniently grow lengthy lengthways, so that the viscera were forced to grow upwards in a compact, spirally coiled hump, giving rise to the characteristic snail form we all recognize.